And there's a fear, I think, of of shaming them for something that is developmentally appropriate, which I agree. I don't think we have to shame anyone. I don't think shame is really ever any – shame should not be a part of our parenting, like the end. But there are a zillion ways to intervene and, and let your child know that's not okay without shaming them for something that is developmentally appropriate. Welcome to Raising Adults, the groundbreaking parenting podcast that starts with the end in mind. We're your co-hosts, Dina Thayer and Kira Dorian. We created future-focused parenting to take families from surviving to thriving. So join us as we help you stop raising kids and start raising adults. Hello, future-focused parents. Welcome to another episode of Raising Adults. Kira and Dina here with you, although not here together quite yet. Kira is over in her toasty laundry room, and I'm under the staircase, and we're excited to talk about some parenting stuff today. (laughs) (laughs) How are you, Kira? I'm well. I'm really well, yeah. I feel like with school wrapping up and the pressures of that going away, um, our whole family's just happier. (laughs) <laughs> it was a rough year, so man. Nice. It was a rough year. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's happy to move into summer and move out of a pandemic. Yes, those are both very positive things. <laughs> oh my goodness, seriously. And I think my kids are just. It's funny because like it wasn't like it was this super intense academic year. It's just more the the. It's just the craziness, like just getting to breathe from. From what mm-hmm. a bizarre year it was, I think is is feeling better. But then also I'm like, oh my gosh, it's summer. I don't even have like the nine o'clock Zoom call that I can rely on to get stuff done. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good point. Some of that whatever bit of structure there was is about to go by the wayside for a while. Yeah, which is its own challenge. I tried not to get too attached to the days, you know, mine were at school. When they went back, it was like two days a week. So I tried not to get attached to the two days a week because I was like, summer's coming, man. (laughs) It's all going away. Don't get attached. (laughs) Don't get too excited. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) How are you doing? I'm well. I'm also excited for summer. We have a few trips planned, which hopefully those can materialize. But it's always nice to have things to look forward to on the calendar. Definitely. Yay. Well, I'm looking forward to our topic today. It's a biggie. It is. And I think it's fairly universal. It doesn't mean you're a bad parent if this has happened to you, you guys. It's definitely very normal, even developmentally, for toddlers, preschoolers to kind of experiment with this, hey, I'm strong. What can I do with my body? And so we're talking today about that behavior that can get physical or maybe destructive either to people or to property. And we want to be really clear too, though, that this is kind of the 10,000 foot view. We aren't behavior experts. We aren't psychiatrists. So this will be more for those of you parenting a more neurotypical developing child who's maybe going through a phase of being a little bit physical or experimenting with what happens when I hit my mommy. (laughs) It really isn't going to be that deeper dive into diagnoses and things like that. So we want to make sure that you know what to expect from our time together today. But I do think Overall, this is pretty universal. A child might try to bite, might try to hit, might not be gentle with the family pet, you know, those kinds of things. Yes. Yes. We are still dealing with the family pet one. Oh, (laughs) delightful. Yeah. It's pretty funny. It's like, really? Really? That's how you want it? Okay. Okay. (laughs) Let's have a chat about that. Poor Guido. This poor puppy. (laughs) He is learning to be so long suffering. (laughs) Yeah. Poor guy. Yeah. Aww. No. No, it's I think that's very true and even even the most delightful gentle children, I think there's like a developmental piece of this, right? And mm-hmm. we're all yeah, I think it's really normal. I think almost every parent has dealt with this in in one way or another. So I'm glad we're getting a chance to talk about it today. Yeah. So with that in terms of how you were future focused around this and you're thinking about it. What was your why? We'll start with our why as we always do. Yeah, I think my why was really around teaching the kids that violence is never okay. We're definitely an anti-violence family in in all ways. And so that was just a really important value in our home. And even though when it did happen, it always happened in a developmentally 
appropriate way. And I mean, I will talk more about this in a minute, but you and I talk about all the time, just because something is developmentally appropriate doesn't mean that I as a parent need to let it go. Uh, It's actually really important that because they're going through that developmentally appropriate stage that I come in as their parent and their teacher to help them learn how to handle that. So my why was really around teaching them that violence isn't okay, no matter what's going on and helping them kind of learn the coping skills that they need to process whatever's going on in the inside in a healthier, more appropriate way. Mm-hmm. How yeah, about that you? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, mine's actually super similar. I think I have actually shared on the show before that one of the things we would say to our kids is it's only fun if everyone's having fun. Yeah, I love <laughs> and that. for me, obviously, if someone's getting hurt, it's not fun for that person anymore. And so this was just a really clear line in our home that if there is a problem to be solved, this isn't the way we solve it. And that it's absolutely okay to be frustrated or angry, but it doesn't mean we break something. It doesn't mean we hurt a person. So it's really exactly what you said. It's like, yes, sometimes we're going to have those big feelings, but what we do with them is what matters. And when it leaks out into this physical or destructive behavior, that does need to be stopped. So that was a big deal to me, especially coming out of a relationship that wasn't healthy in my first marriage. I also really wanted to model and demonstrate how we make sure those things don't happen. So for me, it was also about the person who maybe was getting hit. Like, how do they then stand up for themselves, advocate for themselves? Like, this is something that was just hard stop, period, end of sentence. We don't do it. So it's a really big one. And I think maybe a little extra loaded for me for that reason, possibly. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, one of the things I struggled with, and I think a lot of parents struggle with when this happens, is that that thing, and I know we've shared about this before, but you can't actually like make your kids stop, right? Yep. <laughs> Those situations where you're like, okay, I know this behavior is not okay and I need it to change, but I can't physically change their physical behavior. I can't make them do it. And so what really are the tools? And this is what we're talking about today, but like, what, what can I do? What do I have the power to do to set a tone for, "Mm -mm, no, that doesn't happen in this house. So important that you said that, because I imagine that some of the things that even we'll share today, it would be easy for someone to be saying mentally, oh, but my child won't do that, or that won't work for my child. And so I really want to emphasize Kira and I even chatted beforehand about some of what we were going to share. And these are really mostly tools for you as the parents, because what Kira just said there is absolutely right. It's a truth bomb. Like you can't make it stop in a lot of ways, but you can control your response to it and how you set up an environment that prevents this before it happens and intervenes swiftly when it does. So that's what we're going to be giving you is hopefully some good tools for your toolkit as a parent and not not suggesting that, oh, if you just do A, B, and C in this order, your child will turn into a docile and peaceful human. <laughs> doesn't always go like that. We would be millionaires. <laughs> right? <laughs> so how about some of those practical things? What's something you can share with our audience Yeah. I mean, the first thing I want to say, and I know you agree with this because we actually did chat briefly about this before we hit record, is, again, I kind of touched on at the beginning, but just because something is age appropriate or that your child really doesn't know what they're doing or the impact that they're having does not mean that you get to let it go. And this is what I see when I'm working with parents is a lot of like, you know, the child will smack smack their face or, you know, accidentally punch them or kick them or whatever. And the parents are kind of laughing it off because they know that there's no ill intent there, right? Especially when there's developmentally appropriate limb mm-hmm. flailing. But what happens is- over- <laughs> Did you just say developmentally appropriate <laughs> limb flailing? I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just needed a moment for that. Okay. <laughs> Wow, I love it. I'm gonna make okay, an sorry. acronym for it. <laughs> I will. I will regain my composure momentarily. It's, it's a DALF. Sorry, D A L F. Developmentally appropriate. <sighs> play, like. That was great. Anyway. But you know what I'm saying, right? That like, you know, kids are, they're checking out all kinds of things and they're, they have a tantrum and they accidentally hit you or there's so many different ways that kids are quote unquote showing aggressive or violent behavior where the intention isn't aggressive or violent, right? Yes. And, but I think what happens is parents feel like they have to either 
pretend like it didn't happen, laugh it off because it's developmentally appropriate and it's quote unquote not a big deal, which is true. Like if there's no ill intent there, it's not a big deal. But what happens is then there's not a clear line that's being drawn. And I think parents are afraid that like, oh, if I get upset with my child for accidentally hurting me, I'm sending the wrong message. And I would agree with that. I don't think it's about getting upset. I think the importance is that we're sending a clear message consistently that harming someone or something is not okay. And that we're always intervening when that happens. Like you and I talk all the time about like figuring out these values so that you know what to lean into and what you can just forget and let go. To me, this is something we never forget or let go ever. Mm -hmm. So even though, you know, it might be silly or funny or completely not harmful for the toddler to punch the three-year-old in the face... We still have to swoop in and say, oh, we use gentle touch in our home, you know, and some of these tools that you and I are going to talk about. We have to do it every time. Don't let yourself off the hook just because it's, quote unquote, developmentally appropriate limb flailing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Um, and, and that doesn't mean you have to be unkind or hurtful or, you know, a tyrant about it at all. But we do still have to be a parent. And yeah, this do. is part of it. And that's that's one of the things that that we did. It was just every time it was made clear, oh, that's not how we handle things. That's not how we treat other people's bodies, our bodies, our things. You know, you may not harm yourself. You may not harm other people. You may not break anything. Like those are three Mm -hmm. big, really important rules. And if those things were broken, I had to step in. So that's sort of my first tip is like, don't blow it off. You know, let it go. This is something that has to be consistently said and modeled over and over and over again. A hundred percent. It's it's exactly what you said. If if it gets allowed even a few times, there isn't the consistency, right? In and terms then it's confusing the for the kids. Confusing. Like, well, yeah. I smacked you in the face five times, and now it's the sixth time, and and now you're saying no. Well, I guess it's okay the first five times. Right. Never okay. No. It doesn't mean that they did anything wrong. Here's the difference, guys. They didn't do anything wrong, but that doesn't make the behavior okay. Mm-hmm. So we can send that message like, hey, I just need you to know <laughs> you may not hit me in the face, right? Yes, and this is not one of your options. This is not an option, right? And say it over and over and over again. Instead, And eventually they will get that message as opposed to if you've let them go five or six times and now you're saying it, they're like, okay, well, clearly it's okay sometimes. That's the message yes. you're sending is that yes. sometimes it's okay to hit you in the face. And as we've said, what we permit, we promote. Yep. So if you're allowing it, even sometimes they're thinking, oh, I might I might get away with this here and there, even as they move into an age where there is intent behind it. Right. And that's and that's really not OK. The other thing I hear with this one that really goes along with what you're saying and why you must intervene every time consistently is that that idea you're talking about of kind of laughing it off or, hey, you know, it may be a milestone, but it doesn't mean the behavior that comes with that developmental milestone is appropriate. And you get two that I big ones that I've seen, you get age or gender excuses. Mm-hmm. And it's really unfortunate to me. This happens a lot to boys like, yeah. well, but he's a boy or she's four. <laughs> yeah. And you get kind of this sense that at a certain age, it must be OK. And if you have outdoor plumbing, it must be OK. Well, no. Neither of those are true. And we really need to send the message, regardless of the age and developmental stage of our children and regardless of their gender, that this is a behavior that we don't tolerate in the home. And I I agree. There's this tendency and unfortunately kind of a pervasive view that we kind of chuckle at it or blame it on how old they are or et cetera. So important not to do that. And there's a fear, I think, of of shaming them for something that is developmentally appropriate, which I agree. I don't think we have to shame anyone. I don't think shame is really ever any, shame should not be a part of our parenting, like the end. But there are a zillion ways to intervene and and let your child know that's not okay without shaming them for something that is developmentally Mm -hmm. appropriate. Mm -hmm. And one of them, actually, this is a great segue into one of my kind of hows or takeaways is really a lot of that depends on our words, right? If yeah. if we're using vocabulary that is shame filled, that is going to be problematic. If we're using vocabulary that is gentle and uses a lot of action words and explains very clearly what is allowed and what isn't, then that is sending a consistent and strong message, but without shame. So one of the things I like to suggest even to my coaching clients, and you and I talk all the time, Kira, about leading with our vocabulary, is really Going back to those I statements we talked about even on the episode about kids saying no or talking Mm -hmm. back, really being clear with your words about what you're going to do 
And then the other thing that you mentioned, and I'm going to give an example of each of these in a moment, is saying what we do want to see. Like you gave the example, we use gentle touch in our home. So that's a great example of instead of don't hit, stop that, say what you do want to see. That's one way you can use your vocabulary really powerfully. Now, an example of the other piece, the I statement, is sometimes you do need to intervene in a way that's swift. And I think it's much more effective rather than coming in, what are you doing? Or why are you doing that? Or stop that to say, I'm going to stop your arm. Mm -hmm. And then, and what I love is this does two things. It again, goes off of the offensive, attacking the child for something that maybe they're completely naive to, don't even understand the implications of, or is developmentally appropriate. But second, it gives them the heads up. I think we always need to tell children what's going to happen to them, especially if we are going to touch them. Mm -hmm. And so that I'm going to stop your hand or I'm going to pick you up and take you away from the puppy now. That is important (laughs) for them too, to know what's coming. And we do sometimes have to stop things in that way, but they deserve to know what's going on. And we've talked about that before, but I just think that vocabulary piece is so important. Even with infants, when my children experimented with their new teeth while they were nursing. <laughs> I still said to them, I'm going to take you off now before I popped them off. I gave them the heads up. I wanted to set that foundation, even with infants. I'm going to let you know what's coming, but we don't bite mommy, particularly on the breast. It's a yeah. no from me. Okay. <laughs> no, thank yeah. you. It's a no from me. So I think that piece is really important. And we talk about that all the time. How we speak is then followed up by what we do, but we've got to start there. Yes. Well, and I think I love this because, you know, you and I are all about the vocab, you in particular, but I love it too. Um, but <laughs> the the it also comes back to really how we speak about the, the consistency piece and how we talk about that too. Because I've heard parents say things like, I will not let you hit me, which is great. Except you are mm-hmm. letting them hit you. <laughs> yeah. So how making sure that you mean what you say and you say what you mean. So I love I'm going to stop your arm, which is something I can do. I can mm-hmm. show consistency with that. I can follow that through. If you say I am not going to allow you to hit me, then you need to make sure that you are not allowing them to hit you. Yes. And that's really important. So being really thoughtful about how you're communicating th- these things, right? And and a great going back to what I said earlier, if you have not intervened five times and then you say, please don't hit mommy, that's not consistent. No. So you could, if you realize, wow, I've let that go five times and you catch yourself, you could say, you know, you have hurt my body five times now. This is the sixth time. Please don't do it again. If you do it again, then, right, going back to mm-hmm. what you were saying, let them know what you're going to do. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm glad that we're talking about how we talk about this, too, because that's a big piece. It is. And they need to see that follow through. You're exactly right. If you say, I'm not going to let you, but it's still happening, your actions aren't really backing up what you're saying. So if you've got a child that like likes you to snuggle with them you know, before bedtime and you're laying down in their room, but they're pushing on your face or kicking you, you know, I'm not going to be able to offer this to you anymore if that keeps happening. And then you've got to get up and leave the room. Like they lose the bedtime snuggle. So there's, I think that's the, the, piece that's so important is what we're saying is we talk all the time about future-focused parenting gives you such freedom to go, oh, I know where to step in and which things I can go, hmm, maybe that's not important. This is one you need to pick every time. Prisma, a totally new way to go to school. Do your kids look forward to going to school? Do they complain about being bored in class? Prisma is an online alternative to traditional school for fourth to eighth graders. Prisma knows that most of today's kids will end up working jobs that don't even exist yet. So they focus on developing 21st century skills like creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration, rather than having kids memorize facts and take standardized tests. Prisma offers a flexible curriculum that adapts to every child's interests interest and learning speed, which means your child learns what they're curious about, is never left behind, and gets the attention they deserve from Prisma's expert coaches. Prisma is an innovative online school for 4th to 8th graders that gives them the flexibility to be their best selves while developing the skills they need for a successful future. Admissions for fall 2021 are now live and filling fast. Go to joinprisma.com to schedule a call or learn more. And this kind of led us to your second point. So why don't you go ahead and share 
the other piece that yeah. you wanted to share because we're kind of right there. Yeah, I think I think it does. It lends itself really well to that. And that is that when there is destruction of property or hurting a person, it is really important even from a young age to start teaching the process of reparation and how we go about making that right and making amends. And it's easy to think, well, there's no way to do that, or it's not a logical correlation, but a lot of times there really is. I mean, I get it. If your two-year-old breaks a lamp, you can't go, well, you're going to have to pay for that out of your allowance. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) we totally understand that. But still, even walking through an appropriate apology, maybe I'm going to have my little person, if they've hurt someone, walk with me to the freezer and get them an ice pack. We start learning about how can I help you feel better because I've hurt you. Uh, My kids, it was so cute. They started to kind of, and I think this happens with preschoolers, and I'd rather them go too far this way than the other, but it got a little comical because they almost went too far and they wanted to go get a Band-Aid for everything. They're like, (gasps) I bumped brother. I better go get a Band-Aid. <laughs> but I am I was glad they had learned, I'm going to help make him feel better. Mm-hmm. Or I'm going to help make her feel better. And what can I do? And even down to, we would sometimes say, you know, would you like, would you like a cup of cold water? Sometimes, you know, if you're crying and upset, just cool water can feel really refreshing. So starting to teach even little ones can do things like that. And I think that becomes really helpful in how do we then close the loop? I mean, you and I talk all the time about how precious relationships are. We've done episodes on siblings, episodes on uniting with our partners, and we want to repair that when there's been damage. And in this case, even if it wasn't intentional or if it was a developmental thing or, oh, I didn't really know what I was doing there. It's so important to start learning early. Actually, you said this to me, Kira, and I love this phrasing is that intent doesn't always equal impact. So for a little four-year-old who pushed someone and maybe was just trying to get them out of the way, they're just thinking, oh, the truck's over there I want to play with. The intent maybe wasn't harmful, but the impact still was. And we have such a special opportunity as their first and best teachers to start laying the foundation of learning that and that we still need to work to repair the impact that was had, even if the intent wasn't icky. Yes. And I think this FFPs, listeners, this piece is where being really, really careful about not using shame-based vocabulary is Mm -hmm. key because it it can very easily become, yes, you didn't mean to do it, but essentially you're still sending the message you're a bad kid because you did. And I think that the the reparation piece, I mean, this is like life lesson, guys. Like think about, think about if you had been taught as a child that mistakes happen, that I could do something unwittingly and witting, is that a word? Wittingly? Yes. Wittingly? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. I could do something unwittingly and still have a negative impact and I can own that without shame. I can own that. I harmed mm-hmm. you. I'm sorry that I harmed you. I did not mean to harm you, but I did. And therefore I want to make a reparation, but doing it without the shame is the key. That's the key. Mm-hmm. Because I think, like I said earlier, a lot of parents, and this is right. I agree with you. We don't want to shame our kids for something they didn't mean to do. You don't have to, but we can still teach them the power of closing that loop, the power of repair. I mean, my goodness, from like the mental health piece, repair, 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 repair is the key to everything. So teaching them how how to repair is an amazing life lesson and doing Mm -hmm. it, doing it without shame. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, I have one last thing to share and then, then I'm tapped out and that is, and I've talked about this a little bit before on other episodes, but parents make sure that as you're encouraging this behavior to stop and letting them know that this is not appropriate, that we are also giving them the tools for what is. So if you have a child who is destructive or aggressive because they're feeling a big feeling, we need to teach them, how do I use that big feeling? How do I process that big feeling in a way that is appropriate? So kind of going back to that vocab thing too, what can they do? If you can tell this is coming from anger, it's okay to say, hey, I can see how angry you are. You may not hit me. You may not harm my body, but you can go punch a pillow in your room. That's totally fine. Do you need to stomp on the floor? We can do that. Should we go for a run really, really, really fast together to get those feelings out? We can do that. Please give them a toolbox. It is so unfair to ask kids to stop doing something without letting them know how they can do 
what they're trying to do in an appropriate way. We need to give them both. This behavior is not okay, but those feelings you're feeling are. And here's what you can do with them that is appropriate and a healthy way of expressing and processing them. Mm. Um, So making sure that you're giving them those tools. And if you have not listened to our episode on emotional intelligence and raising emotionally intelligent kids, um, that's a great place to go for some of those tools as well. Yeah, you can get a really great framework for doing that and giving your kids some other options because that piece is important. It's actually super frustrating to a child to be told to stop doing this as an outlet for their anger, but being given no other options as an outlet for the anger. And that piece is so important. And I think that's also tied to shame because it can almost feel like, well, then my feelings must be bad. Thank you for saying that. That's exactly right. It's like the whole situation is wrong instead of, of course you're feeling angry. That makes sense. Anger happens. We all have anger. Here's how I'd like you to learn how to process that. Mm -hmm. That That is definitely the removal of the shame. And let's be honest, you're more likely to get a change. If you just tell a kid, don't do that, and you don't give them, well, what do I do? How do I deal with these feelings? They are going to keep reverting back to that behavior because they don't know what else to do. Yes, and it's the only thing accessible to them because they've been given no other options. So, of course. Um, So I just want to piggyback on the piece I shared a moment ago about reparations for how to adapt that to olders. Mm. And then that's my last thing. Then I'll stop talking, I promise. But With olders, for instance, if something does get broken, it may be appropriate to use that example that I gave earlier to say, you know, you're going to have to pay to repair that, especially if it wasn't just I bumped it on accident. If maybe they were doing something they've been asked not to do, like I asked you to play hide and seek outside, you played inside and broke the neighbor's lamp. We may need to offer to fix that or to buy a new one. But the other thing you can do that's really powerful is inviting their feedback into this process. And I love doing this because sometimes even my own kids have surprised me with the thoughtful solutions they come up with for how to make something right. So I might say something like, you know, this got broken. We need to do something to make that right. What are your ideas? What do you Mm. think we should do? Or, you know, this person was hurt by what you did or what you said. How do you think we should solve that? They often are quite insightful about how to connect. And especially if it's one of their peers, this is where I've found it so beneficial. They often know best what would speak to that person mm. because it's their friend. It's not mine. Right, right. So they might know that person would really appreciate a handwritten note from me, or they'd rather have a hug and a smile. Or you know what? They do just want me to physically go get an ice pack and a water bottle for them. So it, it's really interesting when they can lend that insight. Oh, I know them. Here's what would speak to them and, and help make things better. So we're teaching them to start taking ownership for repairing the relationship or the item or the person's body, right? I love that. Just wanted to add that in. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that into the frame of of the older kids too, because I think as as they get older, we see we see this in different ways, right? You know, even destruction and aggression, it might not look like punching or kicking yeah. or, you know, but it, it might look more like gossiping or, <laughs> yes. you know, like hurtful, aggressive behavior in other ways. And I think I, I love that. I love the idea of bringing them into the fold as well. And because then they, they learn so much more when they're a part of things. They just do. Kids do, mm-hmm. right? When they get to be critical thinkers in the situation. Yes. So yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And as you've said so many times, it gets them to be more on board mm-hmm. with the solution if they're one of the people who came up with it, right? They're they're on the team that said, here's how we can fix it. Then they're definitely on board with wanting to make that happen. I think you get more buy-in. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, FFPs, we hope this has been helpful. Of course, it's a very 10,000 foot view, but if you've got a little one or maybe an older one, you know, trying on some of this stuff. Just know that while it can mean a developmental milestone, it can mean a very appropriate stage and phase of development that we never have to mean the behavior that comes from that is appropriate. We never have to allow things that we know aren't okay. And so we would encourage you to pick this one, to always intervene, to lead with your vocabulary and letting your children know what you're going to do giving them that heads up. Make sure you're giving them other tools for how to handle those big feelings. If you're asking them not to handle it this way, 
We want to be giving them tools for how they can handle it in a productive way and to be encouraging them to make those reparations, to start having an attitude of how do I make this right? That's going to grow them into great adults who are humans we want to see out in the world. And that's really what we're all about. Absolutely. So we hope you will join us next week for our season finale. Can you believe it, Kira? <gasps> no. Season are. four is finishing. And I we're know. We're going to have a season five. How wild is that? It's amazing and uh, incredible. It's incredible. Like we're still here four seasons in. So join us next week for a season four season finale. And then we are going to have some powerful episodes for you while we take a brief break in July. Some powerful replays of episodes that were just really heavy hitters or really touched on a topic we felt was important and that some of you who have joined us more recently might not have heard yet. And so we'd love to get our newer listeners acquainted with those important topics. And then we'll be back with brand new episodes for you on July 19th. So we hope you'll join us for the launch of season five. Yes. Incredible. So next week, season finale, then two weeks of fabulous replays, and then season five. And I'm excited for next week's episode. I'm yeah. looking forward to t- – we're going to talk about what we learned this season as parents yeah. and as people. And this year, this and wild and crazy year. I learned a lot. Be, be ready. Too. Be ready, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Kira's going to unload on you. Look out. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to being back with you next week for the season finale. In the meantime, please hit the subscribe button. Don't miss any of the great content that can come your way or give us a follow on social media. We're on both Facebook and Instagram. And Pinterest. Future Focus Parenting. Oh, yes. And Pinterest. Also Future Focus Parenting. Look at us go. It's We're getting happening. all the social now. Yeah. We're just all over it. So come check it out. Uh, rate, review, do all the things we need you to keep going. And you have been keeping us going. Look at this, four seasons strong. So we appreciate all of you who've been such faithful listeners and those of you who've joined our membership program. We're so thankful to you for your support of what we do at Future Focus Parenting. We'll be back with you next week. Raising Adults is produced by Kira Dorian and Dina Thayer and recorded partially in Kira's laundry room, partially in my coat closet. Editing by the incredible Allison Preisinger. Music by Seattle band Hannah Lee. Thanks for listening.